With two weeks until the Seahawks season opener, they have officially trimmed their roster down to 53 players. Rob and I are going to be breaking down all the decisions John Schneider and Pete Carroll made on our latest installment of Locked on Seahawks. You are Locked on Seahawks. Your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings 12. This is Corbin Smith, your host for Locked On Seahawks. Joining me for our Tuesday episode, my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Thanks to all the 12s out there for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. It's officially cut down day. All 32 NFL teams trimming their rosters from 80 players down to 53. The Seahawks, like usual, waited till the very last second to report all of their decisions as far as cuts, injured reserve placements, you name it. They're normally one of the last teams. They stuck with status quo this year. So Rob and I are going to be diving into some of the surprises and some takeaways from Seattle's 53-man roster. Who stood out? Which moves were a bit perplexing? We'll be taking a look at all of those and checking out the waiver wire, some players that might interest the Seahawks because we know the 53 players that are on the roster today, that is not going to be the roster the Seahawks have when they face the Broncos in two weeks. This episode is brought your way by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit matchup to $100 with promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. Now for your lead story here on Locked On Seahawks. The Seahawks, like the rest of the league, trimmed their roster down from 81 players down to 53. The Seahawks, of course, had that exemption with Aaron Doncor, and he was one of the players that was released on Monday. They announced the rest of their cuts today. Not really any major surprises, but there were a few established veterans that were put on the chopping block. And Rob, I think we've got to start with the second round pick from the 2019 draft, Marquise Blair. And we've talked a lot about the hard hitting safety over the past few weeks. It has really been a struggle for him coming back from a second major knee injury. And even though he was healthy, he was struggling with missed tackles. He wasn't in the nickel corner competition anymore after about a week into camp. He was eliminated from that. And the safety group just simply was too good for him to end up making this roster. So Blair, the biggest name that got cut by the Seahawks today. He, he was, as you said, as a second round pick, you you certainly are expecting a guy like that to, to stay on the roster. Uh, and, and you talked about the, or you mentioned the, the, the durability concerns, but you also mentioned just the, the missed tackles. And, and that to me is what it came down to is I think that the Seattle just viewed uh, their other safeties, obviously their superstar starters uh, and Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams as easily the top two guys. And, and then you just had some other backups, the way that Josh Jones had played this season. I think really kind of seized that opportunity, uh, you know, and, and we saw some of the other players who really stepped up. I mean, Marquise Blair was probably, Probably the, the least consistent of Seattle's open field tacklers. And so it, it doesn't really matter what, what your draft status was a couple of years ago. It matters what you're doing right now. And, and the reality is, is that Marquise Blair was very much on the roster bubble for both of us. We had this conversation yesterday. Uh, and I, I personally thought that Seattle might keep him just because of what he might be able to do on special teams. And so I thought it was interesting that when Pete Carroll was kind of justifying uh, or at least talking about Joey Blunt, the, the undrafted free agent who did make the roster, that he kind of immediately talked about the impact that Joey Blunt made on special teams. Um, so uh, to me, that that is one of the biggest reasons why I think that Marquise Blair is no longer on this roster. And the fact that Pete Carroll kind of talked about in this, in this uh, press conference today that he's basically wishing Marquise Blair well. He, he loved the, 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 the man uh, in terms of his physicality, in terms of his intensity, 
capacity and says that he thinks that he might be able to pursue a starting job elsewhere. So what that suggests to me is that, A, the Seahawks certainly recognize that Marquise Blair is a talent, but also recognize that there are some other players that they might be bringing back on the practice squad. I would be surprised if Marquise Blair is back on the, on the Seahawks practice squad. There, there's always a possibility. He's a good football player. And if other NFL teams are not going to sign him to their active roster in the waiver wire process that we're going to be talking about a little bit later, then sure, if he's still available, you'd love to bring him back. But I think the expectation in Seattle uh, is that Marquise Blair is going to get an opportunity to be on an active roster elsewhere, and that might be why he is playing elsewhere next season. Yeah, I think that the practice squad is probably out of the question at this point. I would anticipate with his pedigree and his playing style, there's going to be somebody that takes a chance to sign him. But really what Pete Carroll said made it sound to me like this was mutual. I think the Seahawks probably approached him and said, hey, you're either going to be a backup or you're going to be somebody we're going to try to get in the practice squad. Josh Jones is in front of you. There's not going to be opportunities for you to play. And he wants to play, especially with all the games he missed the last couple of seasons. And maybe there's a little bit of swallowing some pride here too as a former top pick. And so you just look at the way things transpired. Injuries clearly were a big reason why his career in Seattle did not work out. It derailed his development. At the same time, he's been making the same fundamental mistakes since day one, leading with his helmet as a tackler, not wrapping up, coverage assignment miscues. Those were things that were problematic his rookie year, and they're still a problem now. And I think the Seahawks, they reached the point now in the last year of his rookie deal, adding in the injuries on top of that, Frustration grew and other guys just simply outperformed him. And so he is now going to be on the waiver wire. Teams will have a chance. He's not super expensive. Teams could put in a claim or after that, they could try to sign him outright as an unrestricted free agent. Maybe Seattle re-enters the picture then. Who knows? Blair was not the only notable veteran that got cut today. Freddie Swain, this one was less of a surprise even than Blair to me. In fact, I believe you and I both had him off the roster when we discussed this yesterday. You got to catch the ball in the preseason and training camp when you're a player that isn't DK Metcalf or Tyler Lockett. It doesn't matter if you were the number three receiver last year. It doesn't matter if you're still in your mid-20s and you're supposed to be an ascending player. Freddie Swain regressed this month, and really he had more drops than receptions in the preseason. Good luck making an NFL roster when you have that type of production and you have as much competition as the Seahawks have there. That's what Pete Carroll boiled it down to. The competition simply was better than Freddie Swain. They liked the player. They liked the man. But this is a business. And when you're looking at keeping your best six receivers, Freddie Swain was not in that discussion. He wasn't in the discussion as a special teams player either. So you're talking about two players that the Seahawks got a lot of snaps out of in different capacities that are not going to be back this season. Yeah, that's the thing. As you said, Corbin, I mean, uh, Freddie Swain quite literally dropped his opportunity. And then I think that uh, also the, um, the the flash that we saw from D. Eskridge uh, in, in the final preseason game as a punt returner, the consistent flashes that we've seen from D.J. Dallas as a, as a kick returner kind of uh, lessened the impact that Freddie Swain might be able to have on Seattle's special teams. Um, and, and then again, at the wide receiver position, uh, D. Eskridge and the flashes that you've seen with him, certainly Marquise Goodwin, and just the, the more reliable hands that we've seen from some of Seattle's other receivers, certainly Penny Hart. Uh, and Derek Young, the upside that he possesses as well. I think that there was a lot of hope that, that Freddie Swain would be able to retain his position as Seattle's number three wide receiver. But at the same time, what would Geno Smith be in the quarterback rather than Russell Wilson? Geno Smith is a good quarterback, but he is not the deep ball uh, specialist that Russell Wilson has, has proven himself to be over his career. And that's really one of the areas in which Freddie Swain excelled in the past. So if you didn't see a, a clear pathway for Freddie Swain to, to be an impact player on your receiving core, um, and as well as special teams, then, then really he had to have a spectacular camp to justify making this run. Roster, given the fact that Seattle made the two, uh, you know, uh, selections in, in the draft on, on wide receivers and, and, and signed Marquise Goodwin, as we talked about before. So to me, that was a thing. As you said, we, we both had Freddie Swain on the outside looking in. This is a surprise, I guess, nationally speaking, just because of the fact that Freddie Swain has been productive. I think there's going to be some NFL clubs out there who might look at him because he's been productive. But 
wide receiver is, is arguably the most difficult position to make an NFL roster because there's just so darn many of them. And and the fact is, as you said, Freddie Swain had ascended early, but these this this last year and certainly in training camp, he did not look like he was a player who was continuing that ascent. And that's why that he is no longer a part of the Seattle Seahawks. You're looking at a sixth round pick that's only got two years left in his rookie deal versus a player like Dariq Young that's got more physical tools and more athletic upside, and he's got four years left on his deal. That is going to make the decision by itself. Yet, in the fact that Young was much more productive in practice and in the preseason games, this really felt like it was inevitable and the writing was on the wall. Blair truly was on the bubble. I thought that Swain had played himself off the bubble here over the last week or so, and it looks like the Seahawks felt the same way based on how quickly they made their decision here and the comments that Pete Carroll made after their practice today. We're going to continue breaking down Seattle's initial 53-man roster with some takeaways coming up here next on our Tuesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. As a diehard fantasy player, I'm rolling with Josh Allen to throw for over 400 yards, Jonathan Taylor to amass three rushing touchdowns, and Cooper Cup to snag 10 receptions in week one. Those might seem like bold leaps, but with prize picks, it's easy to play daily fantasy and put those entries to the test. Pick two to five players, and if they go score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. No competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. And prize picks offers projections on any sport you watch. It could be NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, soccer, MMA, disc golf, Euro basketball, you name it, they've got it all covered. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Safe and fast withdrawals. They currently operate in over 30 states and Canada. Download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Prize Picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on and sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Joining me for our Tuesday episode, my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Thanks to all the 12s for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. Make sure to check out the Ultimate Pro Football Preview starting on August 31st. Coming up here shortly, we've got an eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NFL season. Our local team of experts here at the Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey NFL Insiders will combine into one ultimate NFL preview. Again, that starts August 31st. Search for the Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Like the rest of the NFL, the Seahawks trimmed their roster today down from 80 down to 53 players. This is the initial 53. There are going to be a lot of changes from here on out. Anybody that's followed the Seahawks and every other team in the NFL for that matter knows that these rosters are fluid, especially those bottom four or five spots. They are rotating players year-round based on positional needs, especially when injuries start to hit. There will be more changes coming for the Seahawks in coming days. The roster is probably going to look a lot different when they play Denver on Monday Night Football in week one. That being said, most of these players, Seattle's hoping, are going to be on the field for them when they face off against Russell Wilson and company in a couple of weeks. Let's talk takeaways. We've already looked at Marquise Blair and Freddie Swain. To me, those are the two biggest veteran names that were part of the cuts today. What is something that jumped out to you immediately looking at this final 53-man roster for the Seahawks? Well, there's actually a couple of things, Corbin. The first one, as you said, I mean, it just sounded like the, the book had been closed with Marquise Blair and, and Freddie Swain, just kind of listening to the way that Pete Carroll described them. Um, I would argue that one of the other veterans that got released with that was a bit of a surprise was the nickel cornerback, Justin Coleman. And again, going back to Pete Carroll's words in his uh, practice press conference, it sounded like the Seahawks are really hopeful that they might be able to get Justin Coleman back. And so that kind of goes back to your point that this 53 man roster is incredibly fluid. Uh, but at the same time, uh, to me, the, the number one takeaway just has to be the youth movement. And we, we talked about, we, we've, we've kind of celebrated uh, the idea of Seattle having a terrific 2022 NFL draft class. And it certainly looks like it. We, we've talked so much about the rookie wide receivers, about 
about the rookie quarterbacks, about the rookie offensive tackles. I mean, seven of their nine draft picks made the team outright. The edge rusher Tyreek Smith, of course, is going to start is going to be on the on the IR, but that just means that he's got a year to develop. Uh, after he has struggled with injuries uh, throughout the training camp process. And I think that Bo Melton has a real chance to wind up being on, on Seattle's practice squad, although he is going to have some opportunities to look elsewhere as well because he didn't make the 53-man roster. But you consider that seven of those nine draft picks made the team, as well as two undrafted free agents as well. This truly is a youth movement in a lot of different ways. And to me, when you're looking at this from Seattle, for the Seahawks perspective in the long term and how you actually build a championship roster, I think this is something that Seahawks fans should be uh, you know, excited about. Yeah, I got to give you props first and foremost from yesterday's show, picking Joey Blunt, the undrafted rookie safety out of Virginia to make this 53-man roster. That was the one real shocker on both of our final projections, and you ended up being right on that one. As Pete Carroll mentioned, a lot of it had to do with special teams, but he made some good plays on defense as well. He's ultimately the one that edged out Marquise Blair off this roster, and Blunt is the fifth safety for the Seahawks. So, They've got two undrafted rookies that made this football team. I think that's something that's notable when we're talking about the youth movement. I'm not surprised that most of the draft picks made the team. I had eight of them on my projection. I thought maybe Tyreek Smith would have a chance to make it back. The Seahawks decided this is an injury that's lingering. Let's let him heal up this season. We can develop him when he's on injury reserve. So he is still very much part of their future. Bo Melton, it sounds like they may have interest in him still being part of the future. They got to hope they get him back on the practice squad. But this is a group they've been very fired up about. So I'm not surprised that seven of the players made this first 53-man roster. And I would expect that all seven of those guys are going to stay on the team moving forward. I don't expect any fluidity there. But to have two undrafted rookies on top of that, we were wondering if any were going to make this football team as of a week ago. And Vi Jones was considered the favorite to make the team. He was cut today. But you were able to get Joey Blunt on the team, and I'm gonna I'm gonna end up butchering the name Josh Oniogo. I think I might have actually gotten this time the Division Three pass rusher out of Framingham, uh, Framingham State. Again, a Division Three school. Maybe that is the biggest takeaway for me. You and I have talked about this so much over the last two or three years. When when have John Schneider and Pete Carroll drafted players that were not from Power Five conferences? It just doesn't happen much. Even their undrafted free agents, they sign some guys from smaller schools, but typically, most of the time, those aren't the undrafted rookies that make a splash. It's guys like Doug Baldwin from Stanford or Puna Ford coming in from Texas. You know, big schools that played Power Five competition. For every Brock Coyle that played at Montana, there's four or five of those guys that played Power Five schools that end up making an impact for the Seahawks. To have two players in this 53 man roster, one being an undrafted rookie in Odiogo, and then Dariq Young coming from Division II, Lenore Ryan, and a chance to maybe play some snaps in offense and special teams right away. I think that that is a major revelation for the Seahawks and maybe a sign that maybe they're shifting the way they evaluate players a little bit and maybe just maybe taking a little more of a look at some of those lower level players because there's clearly some talent down in those lower levels. Oh, no question about it. Uh, and I, I think the Seahawks scouts de deserve a little bit of credit for finding some of these Absolutely. kind of diamond in, yeah. in the rough uh, kind of players. And, and certainly Seattle's coaching staff deserves some credit because Pete Carroll, uh, you know, and his coaches since he came to Seattle has always shown a willingness to give these undrafted free agents that opportunity. And again, I, I, I listened to Pete Carroll's press conference and, and he kind of, you know, maybe scoffed a little bit at the idea that, that some of the rookies now know about players like like Doug Baldwin, as you mentioned, came from Stanford. Jake Curran comes from Cal. Jermaine Curse comes from University of Washington. These are big schools that, that they just wound up not getting drafted and then obviously wound up becoming very good players for the Seahawks as those undrafted free agents. But yeah, to see a guy from Framingham State, Division Three school, uh, you know, Derek Young, Lenore Ryan, uh, a Division Two school, you know, you, you just don't expect them to be pro ready. You don't expect them to have the physiques, uh, you know, that they do and, and to seize those opportunities. I mean, you know, Josh O, as I'm going to call him here, I mean, he had the sack. I mean, I, I talked about that before with Vi Jones, why I argued that I thought that Vi Jones would make this roster. And I do think there's a very, very strong possibility that he winds up making this practice squad. But at the same time, he did not actually make the sack that, that Josh O did. 
Uh, you know, and so to me, that is the kind of thing that the Seahawks, I think, had to be convinced that these small schoolers could do it. And that's the coolest thing. It is very similar to what we saw with John Radigan coming from Army. Uh, you know, is that, hey, sometimes these guys actually are that good. They just are coming from relatively small school programs. And, and so the, to me, that that is absolutely one of the most exciting things about this is it does really feel like, like Seattle truly was looking at the players on their roster with completely open eyes. Kind of going back to the whole Freddie Swain and Marquise Blair situation. If you took those jersey numbers off and you just – put you know they had no name on the back of their jersey and you just watch them play then freddie swain and marquise blair did not deserve to be on this 53-man roster but that was not the case with josh o and Derek young they were difference makers from the get-go and basically earned this job this wasn't one splashy play in a preseason game this was consistently being uh difference makers uh throughout training camp and, and throughout the preseason games and i'll, I'll say all this again also acknowledging that this is a very fluid roster would not be surprised if, if guys who are on the bottom of the roster, including the players that we just mentioned, these rookies, uh, whether they be drafted or not, may not wind up being on Seattle's roster by the time that the Seahawks actually line up against the Denver Broncos a couple of weeks from now. Yeah, we're going to be discussing that here in a few minutes, the possibility there may be a few newcomers that come in and push a few of these players off. But I will say this, at least in Dariq Young's case, I think Dariq Young, he is going to be – on the roster. Now, whether he dresses in week one, that remains to be seen. He might be one of the guys they end up having inactive. We don't know how that's going to play out, but I expect that he is going to be on this roster. Oniogo, that's a little more of a fluid situation, but Tyreek Smith being out, you like to have at least five pass rushers. He would be number five, and he's kind of one of those players that really came on strong late in the preseason. You like the motor he brings to the table. And certainly he looks the part of an NFL 3-4 outside linebacker. This guy is a thick, muscular, around 255 pounds, kind of low to the ground. Just looks like he would be a difficult guy to block. Rushing off the edge, has good burst, is very strong at the point of attack. So he is a player that very excited about him. Going from D3 to the NFL, just like Dariq Young, those guys, it's such a big jump that you have to believe the ceiling is pretty high for those players once they figure out the speed of the NFL. And these two guys have really adapted quite well. So again, I, I think that that is a major story here, not just the youth movement, but the type of rookies that we're seeing because that just has not historically been how Pete Carroll and Judge Snyder have done business with division two and division three players coming in and making the roster. It just hasn't really happened up to this point. You got two of them in one year that make the roster really quick. I want to mention a guy that did make the 53 that was in a very similar spot to Marquise Blair. In fact, he was drafted the same draft. He was Seattle's first round pick that year, had a dreadful third season. He's been out with an elbow injury. And yet LJ Collier and Miles Adams both are on Seattle's initial 53 man roster that left a lot of fans scratching their heads. I will say this, this is kind of one of those mechanisms that you'll see teams use based on what Pete Carroll said today. He did not come out and say that they were going to put LJ Collier on injured reserve, but I think that that is what is going to happen here. I think that they kept him on the roster initially, and then they're hoping they can put him on injured reserve. He would miss a minimum of four games, but they could stash him. It would give them an insurance policy when inevitably another guy in that defensive line gets banged up. And then hopefully by then his elbow is feeling better. And then they could activate him. They might do that with John Reed too, who was another surprise making this roster. But LJ Collier, I don't think it was necessarily a case of where, well, he did a lot this training camp. He earned the spot. They still think he can help them. And they didn't want to cut him outright, especially with the fact he wasn't able to prove himself doing an injury but that injury may be a blessing in disguise in the sense they're going to get a little more roster flexibility if they put him on injured reserve. It opens up a roster spot and you still have rights to him and he could play later in the season. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, it does give you a little bit more roster flexibility, but I also think that we do need to acknowledge what we've been talking about previously is that LJ Collier did look like a different guy this year. He was just in a different type of shape and a guy that I think is going to be better suited to the 3-4 scheme, the two-gapping scheme that Seattle is going to ask him to play. He is not going to be a pass rusher, and that's the thing is there's this, all these unrealistic expectations. Just because a player gets drafted in the first 
round. The Oakland, or excuse me, the Las Vegas Raiders just made the same kind of a move. And if they cut the the tackle that they drafted from Alabama of all places, Alex Leatherwood, uh, you know, just uh, you know, just today I mean, as a former first round pick just two years ago. And I think that sometimes because they're a first round pick, you have these expectations of players. LJ Collier is a good football player. If Seattle would have cut him, he would have got signed elsewhere. I think that whether if they are able to keep him on this roster, if he does sit out the first four games, I still feel confident that LJ Collier can come in, whether it be Seattle or elsewhere, come in and be a legitimate contributor to an NFL team. Yeah, it just doesn't sound like he's healthy. So this might be the best situation for both parties. Hey, LJ, we're going to keep you around, but we're going to let you get healthy inevitably there are going to be injuries as the season progresses. There will be an opportunity for LJ Collier again to contribute for the football team. I don't think they necessarily felt that way about Marquise Blair, just with the depth and the young players they have. They have a couple other safeties they really like that they cut, maybe like Scott Nelson or Deontay Williams can up on their practice squad. That was just a crowding out situation. They still feel Collier can contribute and he didn't get a chance to prove himself. Marquise Blair did and just had a, poor training camp and preseason for the most part. So a little different story for those two. And so I'm surprised at the same time, I do think they're going to use that injured reserve mechanism to stash him and hopefully bring him back when they need him later in the season. Coming up next, the Seahawks roster is going to be fluid over the next several weeks, the rest of the season, really. But this time of year, especially, yeah, they've got their fit to the man roster, but there's going to be several changes coming up and, Teams will be able to pluck players off the waiver wire tomorrow. Rob and I are going to be breaking down a few players from multiple teams that were released today in final cuts that could intrigue the Seahawks. We'll be looking at centers. We'll be looking at tackles. And, of course, linebackers coming up next. Are you one of those people who thinks it's okay to drive stoned? What's the worst that can happen? You end up driving below the speed limit. It's no big deal, right? Wrong. The truth is your reaction times slow way down when you're high. You not only put yourself in danger, but everyone around you. Talk about a buzzkill. Stop kidding yourself. It's not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind the wheel. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high. Get a DUI. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Tuesday edition. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Joining me for today's show, my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Thanks to all the 12s out there for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. It's Fantasy Draft Week on the Locked On Podcast Network, so go make Locked On Fantasy Football your second listen. We've got fantasy expert Vinny Iyer. He brings over 20 years of NFL expertise and a unique angle to give you the moves no one else has. Get ready for your fantasy draft with Locked On Fantasy Football, available everywhere you listen to podcasts. The Seahawks down to 53 players as of the 1 p.m. deadline today, their initial 53, and we are going to keep mentioning this caveat, Rob, but these 53 players are not going to be the same 53 the Seahawks have on their roster when they play the Denver Broncos in a couple weeks on Monday Night Football. Most of these guys will be on the roster, but there are going to be some significant changes. You're going to see musical chairs. Every team in the league is going to be doing it. And the big reason why, tomorrow, teams are going to have the ability to put in waiver claims on players that were released by the other 31 teams. Other teams will be able to do that with Seattle's players that they released. Some of the vested veterans will be an unrestricted free agent. They can just go sign with teams but most of these players are going to hit the waiver wire and the Seahawks in the past like other teams have taken advantage of this and claimed a few players last year Dakota Shepley and Nigel Warrior were two players that they claimed off waivers from other teams teams will look at Seahawks players as well and that leads to our discussion here who are some players that hit the waiver wire from the other 31 teams that could pique the interest of the Seattle Seahawks and I'm sure I know which position group that you are going to be addressing first yeah, I got to talk about the inside linebacker spot. I mean, it was something that that I, I viewed safety as the strongest position on Seattle's defense, and that was a big part of the reason why I was arguing. I thought that Joey Blunt might make this roster. Same thing with the, the running back position on offense. But I think the inside linebacker is a huge area of concern for this club. Uh, you know, Tanner Muse wound up getting himself released. Who knows? Maybe he comes back on the practice squad. Um, be, but behind Jordan Brooks and, uh, you know, Cody Barton right now, all you have is Nick Bloor. And Nick Bloor is a good football player. Don't get me wrong. 
He was one of the players, however, that I thought may not be able to make this roster because of the aforementioned youth movement that this club made. So I looked out there at all the different players that were uh, that were released, um, and and there are a couple of different names that that really jump out to me. Now you mentioned the fact that this is a waiver wire process, Corbin, and that's the thing is that Seattle can be all hot and excited about some particular player, but if one of the other teams that is slotted ahead of them in the waiver wire process also submits a claim, then Seattle is left out in the cold. And that's what I was meaning before what I was trying to discuss before when I said like, Hey, if Marquise Blair doesn't get picked up by somebody, see, I would love to have a guy like that back there. The, the upside is obvious. Uh, but at the same time, I do think that inside linebacker should be Seattle's priority. They have the 10th position in the waiver wire at this point. So here, just without any further ado, here are a couple of different names that I think really make some sense at specifically at that inside linebacker position. Now, I, I know there's going to be a lot of people who are going to fall in love with the idea of Jer Jared Davis. Uh, you know, this is a former first round pick out of Florida, Detroit Lions, number 21 overall pick back in 2017. He struggled with injuries, uh, and, and he wasn't a very good football player last year. Uh, he was originally drafted by Detroit, wound up spending last season with the New York Jets, and that's going to be interesting right there because Robert Sala, of course, is the head coach there. Seattle knows him very well. Maybe they are able to get a little bit more insight on Jared Davis than maybe some other clubs because of the connection with the Jets head coach. And, and speaking of connections, if we're going to go there, then what about Jermaine Carter? Uh, Jermaine Carter Jr. is a guy that was a, a, a four-year starter at the Carolina Panthers. And, of course, that has now led the, their general manager, Scott Fitterer, former Seahawks scout. Jermaine Carter Jr. wound up getting cut by the Kansas City Chiefs. As I mentioned, he's a four-year starter there uh, in, in Carolina before, goes to Kansas City. He was a guy that uh, this past season started all, said all 17 games, had a career-high 88 tackles. Uh, you know, he's played in all 65 games of his career, uh, but he's only started 30 of them. I, I previously mentioned they had started all, all four career, all four years. I apologize for that. What I meant is that he's played in all 65 games of his NFL career. What that suggests to me is he's not only a good player on defense, he's a good player on special teams. And that is clearly going to be something that Seattle focuses on. So Jermaine Carter doesn't have the big name. But at the same time, he has the athletic ability, 6'1", 225 pounder, that might make some sense for Seattle. Another big name is Joe Schobert. Uh, you know, Denver uh, got released by Denver. He was, I mean, he, he was a Pro Bowler a couple of years back. I mean, he wound up leading the all of the NFL in tackles uh, a, a few years back with the Cleveland Browns. He's kind of bounced around a little bit, but to me, that's one of the kind of players I think would make an awful lot of sense for Seattle. They're not looking for a starter here. You got a superstar in Jordan Brooks. You got a solid developing player in Cody Barton, who I personally believe really could be a, a very good player for the Seahawks. I don't know that you necessarily want a guy who has such a pedigree behind him, like a, like a, say a Jared Davis, for example, that then you're going to have a guy like Cody Barton, maybe looking over his shoulder the whole time. That, that's been one of the knocks that some have with the San Francisco 49ers opting to bring back their quarterback, Jimmy Garoppolo. What, what, what impact is that going to have on Trey Lance's development? Similarly, I think that Seattle has to have that conversation with themselves about Cody Barton, about Tanner Muse or Vi Jones, should they elect to bring those players back. So I, I think that Joe Schober it would be a quality kind of a guy to bring in as a backup that if you needed him to play starting ball, then he could do so. Quickly, a couple other players that kind of jump out to me. If, if we're going to talk about Denver Broncos, that's where Joe Schobert was. Barrington Wade is another guy who is not quite as good as far as just being a defensive player, but he is a superior special teams player. So Barrington Wade, he, he came from Iowa. Of course, you and I are real big fans of what Kirk Ferentz does there. So we're talking about pro-ready linebacker. And then if you want a completely different type of linebacker, when I think of a 3-4 defense, and we've talked a lot about how Seattle is making these schematic changes, then you want a thumper. And, and Seattle has some guys who are you know, athletic, but not necessarily thumpers. Jordan Brooks could do it all. But if you're looking for a true thumper, then Kanai Mualga, another undrafted free agent, was actually with Denver, got released. I mean, he is just as physical as it gets. Jannard Avery is another one, got released by Philadelphia, as physical as it gets. Not the special teams guys, not the kind of guys that are going to be able to run in coverage. But if you want somebody in a 3-4 defense to be able to take on an oncoming guard, put him on the ground, slide over and hit the running back in the hole, 
the Mauga and Avery are two of the guys that make sense in that way. So again, this is one of the reasons why we talked about, we thought that Seattle might be able to try and get a little bit cute at the inside linebacker position because there were going to be so many really good, legitimate NFL players that were going to be available on the waiver wire. And this is the proof right here. Yeah, you mentioned a few names that were on my list as well. In fact, that we had very similar linebacker lists. Jared Davis is the one that many of our listeners have been bringing up. And it's understandable why, as you mentioned, for coming from Florida was a first-round pick, and he had a few really good years in Detroit where he was racking up over 100 tackles and was able to generate pressure. He has traditionally been a really good blitzing linebacker. So he's been able to do a little bit of everything, but – Last year was an unmitigated disaster in New York. And pro football focus, it's not the Messiah, but they gave him a 28 for his overall grade last year. And then I looked into the stats and you can see why. His missed tackle percentage was north of 25%. He had one pressure the entire year as a pass rusher, and he blitzed quite a few times. So he wasn't useful in that regard. And in coverage, he allowed an 88% completion rate in coverage. So basically, he did nothing even mediocre last year. He was terrible in everything, but he's only 27 years old. Detroit's got some really good young linebackers. He went back to Detroit in free agency, and Dan Campbell and company's like, you know what? We like our young linebackers here. Not a fit. So at 27, he was the old man getting kicked to the curve, and it's been a few years since he's had a really good season. So it might be somebody that's worth taking a flyer on because we know that Pete Carroll – considers himself a master motivator and he has brought in guys like that that are able to rejuvenate their career uh, but there certainly are some major question marks there when you look at how poorly he played a year ago and even the season before in Detroit there's a reason they didn't pick up the fifth year option very inconsistent in his time with the Lions coming out of Florida Schobert I think would be the ideal veteran just because I think he's at the stage of his career he understands I've been cut several times by multiple teams there's been a few injuries sprinkled in there I'm sure he just wants to be on a roster and have a chance to compete and he can play special teams. It's going to be another really good voice to have in the locker room. Even Jordan Brooks can learn from Schobert with being somebody that's been a pro bowler that has started a lot of games in the NFL. So those are two names that immediately jumped out to me when I was looking at the waiver wire, because I think those are the kind of players that would make some sense for Seattle right now. Certainly there are some other young linebackers that they could take a look at as well. I want to dive into a couple other positions, though, because linebacker, obviously, in my opinion, I think you would agree. I think linebacker is the most immediate need they have with Nick Ballore being their third inside linebacker. That is not where you want to be. And I'm sure John Schneider's working the phones, looking for maybe some trades out there, looking at some of the players going to be on the waiver wire, figuring out what they're going to do on that front. But I mentioned it yesterday. I think that center is still a position behind Austin Blythe that it would make sense, especially with Dakota Shepley struggling the way that he did at times this training camp and preseason. Don't know that they're going to bring him back in the practice squad. There might be some even younger options that are available. And two names that jumped out to me, Alec Lindstrom, who played at Boston College, was an undrafted signing for the Dallas Cowboys, did not make their team. It sounds like Dallas is hoping to bring him back on their practice squad. But Lindstrom's got pedigree. His brother was a high draft pick in the NFL, not the same caliber of player. I don't think he's a starter, but he's got good athleticism. He's got a great football background. That would be somebody that I'm trying to take a flyer on. If somehow the Cowboys aren't bringing him back to the practice squad, Kyle Fuller, I don't think is your long-term backup answer. You've seen what he does on the field. He's been average at best when he has started. There's been a lot of games he's really struggled. Lindstrom would be a player that would maybe intrigue me to develop behind Austin Blythe and Kyle Fuller right now as a practice squad player. And Michael Mennett, who played at Penn State, a little smaller center. But again, this is a zone-based scheme. Austin Blythe is not a big center either. Mennett's more of a technician, not as long of arms, but this is a guy that could be a good scheme fit that got released by his previous team as well. So those might be some players who were late round or undrafted players that could make some sense in your scheme that you could bring in and you could potentially try to develop them at the pivot position behind Blythe, or you're hoping is going to be your long-term answer at that position. And I want to mention a tackle here too, as well. And the 49ers actually released a handful of guys with starting experience today. One of the few teams that did that, but Justin school who has started 12 games at tackle for the 49ers the last couple of years, when their starters have been banged up, He brings a lot of experience, still a fairly young player, and you always want the opportunity to pluck 
players from your division rivals. The Seahawks have actually had some pretty good success. Look at DJ Reed, for example, bringing in guys from the 49ers. There's been other times it hasn't worked out like a Kella Witherspoon, but they still got a fifth round pick from the Steelers for him. So in the end, that was still somewhat of a win, but I digress. School is a guy that I think would be a nice addition just because there's so much inexperience at tackle. You're going to be starting two rookies, and the two guys that are backups, Jake Curran and Stone Forsythe, have played really six games on the offensive line combined. They could use a veteran voice that has started quite a few games in the NFL on this roster. So school might be a player that intrigues me a little bit to bring in some 49ers flavor to your offensive line. Yeah, and I love that you mentioned that aspect. I just trying to steal from an opponent. Uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why I mentioned three different Denver Broncos inside linebackers, just because I think that they're good football players. You also might be able to get some insight from your week one opponent here. Um, and and again, if, if we're gonna go the offensive line routes, there are a lot of quality interior offensive linemen there. Uh, and, and the tackles uh, in Kansas City Chiefs, for example, it released a player Roderick Johnson who. Uh, has played both sides. He started both the left tackle and right tackle in the NFL. So that type of versatility, I think, would be intriguing as well. The, the point here is, Corbin, is I, I think that you and I both agree that Seattle's starters are set. But they, you certainly want to massage the bottom of that roster, be able to make it a little bit better. And there are some really good football players out there that you might be able to do that with. And I think that while there's all kinds of negativity out there amongst some Seahawks fans about, oh, this season is going to heck and blah, blah, blah. I think that same thing we talked about before. Seattle is obviously embracing the youth movement. I think you have to give them at least initially some credit for what their rookie draft class looks like, both the drafted players and undrafted players. I think the same thing goes to their pro scouts. The pro scouts, their job is to watch all the different other 31 NFL teams out there. They recognize there's a lot of good football players out there. They recognize the Seahawks are known for giving these guys, no matter how, when you were drafted or who you are, giving them opportunities to play. That might make Seattle an, an optimum landing spot for some of these free agents out there who are looking to get onto the field as quickly as possible. And I'll just throw this out here real quick, kind of to wrap up the show. I would not be shocked if Seattle takes a look at a quarterback that is on the waiver wire yeah. too. And I'm going to throw this name out there. I'm not predicting this struggled in Minnesota mightily, but Kellen Mond with his athleticism and he has some arm tools that might be somebody, if they're not going to bring back Jacob Eason, that's probably ultimately what they will do is bring back Eason in the practice squad. But if they decide to go another route, Mond might be a player that piques some interest just because of the physical tools and maybe a change of scenery could help him out. There's a few other quarterbacks that are out there that might be worth kicking the tires on as practice squad players. So that is another position that might be a wild card to watch here if Jacob Eason indeed is not the one to bring him back or Eason gets a chance somewhere else. I wouldn't rule that either with his physical tools that he brings to the table as well. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Make sure to check out Locked on Seahawks on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. We're also available five days a week streaming on YouTube. Coming up on our Wednesday episode, going to continue diving into the roster, take a look at some of the moves made on Wednesday. I guarantee Seattle's going to make a few splashy moves tomorrow where they're going to be claiming some players off waivers or they might even make a trade or two. You can guarantee John Schneider is going to be continuing to try to upgrade this roster heading into week one. We'll be breaking that all down on our latest episode. You won't want to miss it. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Go Hawks.